Okay, so it's fine. Okay, welcome. Here we are back again. And uh, let's ring the bell. Let's make that a tradition. So as we listen to the ring of the bell, we hear the sound of wisdom. And bliss of wisdom. Okay, turn to, to begin again on page 43. Of our wisdom is bliss, the four friendly fun facts that can change your life. In my, I'll start by reading, in my own early learning days, I was certain that nirvana did exist as a place. It was a real turn on for me. This, so I was totally Theravada in a way, even though I was learning from the Buddhist, but I, I had a kind of Theravada attitude. This possible freedom from suffering, it should be a place that was true freedom. But I also felt mistakenly, you know, well, that meant that I felt mistakenly that nirvana was located elsewhere, that it was a space outside, that the world was mere illusion, and that the idea was to get out of it and into the trouble-free nirvana that seemed to be out there waiting for me in space and time, waiting for me. This dualistic way was how I understood nirvana in relation to samsara, a term that refers to the karmic evolution-driven and, and misknowledge-driven endless cycle of life, death, and rebirth, reincarnation. I knew immediately, yet inexplicably, that there was such a thing as nirvana, such a freedom. Perhaps this strong feeling came from a previous life. It was as if I always expected it and did not doubt it at all. But I did think of it as being elsewhere, as somewhere else to go, because I had a strong sense of feeling separate from everything. I wanted that separateness to be confirmed forever, and I felt the only way of getting away from being bothered by others was to be separate from everyone. So, so in a way, I wanted to be a psycho. <laughs> I can freely say now. You know, but somehow I luckily didn't go into being a psycho. At least I don't think so. Someone else might have a different view. Who knows? The second friendly fun fact of noble truth, I also understood right away as pointing to the negation of the illusory sense of separate self, but yet still wanting that separate self to become a selfless nirvana of a final separation or apartness from the world around me. That's what I thought. I'm going to zoom up and get above it all, get out of it all. I was still selling short the third friendly fun fact or noble truth. However, the one that's really true as a depiction of reality, Buddha's great truth, his great discovery. You know, we don't need to celebrate Buddha for his first noble truth or friendly fun fact that if you as long as you feel separate from everything else it will make you suffer you will suffer as long as you misknow your connectedness to reality fail to know that you will suffer but that's not a great thing that's normal to observe that everybody is always suffering what is extraordinary what buddha is saying was is also the experimental experiential scientific therefore reality discovery that the real nature of life is nirvana. That's what it really is. Nirvana is already what it really always has been, what it really is. We just make out of that, it allows us to make out of that a samsara where we stress out. But that's, a, that's, that's luckily always less real. That's just a sort of illusory fabrication somehow. But on the other hand, when we think it's a really real, which I do, I still do. I still think, oh, yeah, I'm stuck here in this room. I don't know. I don't, this is not nirvana. It's like blah, blah, my study, my studio, etc. As long as I do that, then I don't experience it as nirvana. But, but the different setting of the Dharma is right from the beginning where he said, that third one, this nirvana, is what I really have discovered. This is the profound. This is the, this is the, peaceful. This is the, the the transparent, the crystalline. This is the uh, unproliferating, and this is the uncreated, actually, uncompounded. This is nirvana. This is it. It always has been. 
like an elixir of immortality, this goes beyond death and life. Life has the opposite of death. It goes beyond those. And it is uh, an experience. I know it by being it. And, but whoever I try to teach it to, they won't get it because it's inexpressible in any normal way. But, so I'm just going to hang out, he said that. And that was a way of showing that he wasn't going to try to bother people. But he then immediately does actually become a coach for people after after being invited to do so. I was still selling the third noble truth, however, the one that's really true as a depiction of reality, Buddha's great truth, his great discovery, scientific one. I so wanted it to be a final separation. I couldn't imagine being in the midst of all this and blissing out all the time. A state beyond. I had had bliss states, but then one almost comes down from them loses them. But I, I didn't think it could possibly be always the constant non-dual state, the Buddha state. I couldn't imagine it. By calling it a final non-dual state, I was able to ignore the fact that its imagined apartness was the final hideout of duality, the duality between the relative world and an imagined non-relational reality located outside of it and apart from it yet accessible to me. This self-centric psychosis about nirvana does not get beyond the first and second friendly fun fact or noble truth. As long as one misknows reality, feels separate from others, and reifies the self as the real thing, thinking that, thinking that others are very different, then birth, life, death, and the relationships are all unsatisfactory. They cause suffering. The dualistic understanding of a nirvana apart from the world around me, the way I understand nirvana at first, understood it at first, fit with my immature, escapist feeling that I wanted to reach a pure space beyond everything and a pure eternal time and a pure eternal space, infinite space, away from everything. I thought one had to leave the world to find peace and satisfaction. So I misunderstood the real meaning of nirvana. Still, I was very gung-ho about it. So it had that good effect, even though my motivation was based on a continuing misknowing. It was at least gave me intensity. But my beloved Geshe Wanja, the Dungeon saw this escapism in me just as the Buddha saw that tendency when he was teaching egoistic, mostly male Brahmins, and saw their escapism, their seeking after some place to get away from it all, to a road less traveled, or perhaps a road of no more travel. The fact that the goal of nirvana can be misperceived as a realm apart makes it a less effective path of a seeker's evolution, because it leads to an addiction to quietistic states of aloofness, dwelling happily in contemplative realms wherein one cannot easily develop one's compassion for others. So it isn't that people who do that get lost there and then they never become Buddhas. No, everybody does. But it's, it takes them much longer because they have become so aloof because their psychosis, their sense of being sort of not being there or something is so strong they get trapped in that feeling of freedom. And then to slowly imagine beings that suffering still exists in the world, and they have to somehow fuse the feeling of freedom with the empathy and compassion of feeling others misknowing driven suffering. They can't imagine that. So it takes a really long time. Compassion is the most important aspect of full enlightenment, because without it, one too easily enters a state of being unmoved emotionally. By the way, there are people who achieve awakening without compassion. They do have awakening into such a state, though. 
They become a kind of, and then they don't die because they don't necessarily become a formless realm deity. They sort of keep coming back to human. They have an inner compassion, an inner sense of relationality, of relativity, joy, that they don't lock into a disembodied state and dis temporarily disconnected state. They don't lock into a kind of, a, but they don't absolutize that state in the same way that people who become formless realm deities, at least in the Buddhist analysis of the way the world is, they don't become that. They come, keep coming back to human. But they assume they will become that after they pass away. The human body, the momentum of the life force of the human body just naturally dissolves. They will then become sort of that that sort of disembodied, formless nirvana deity, separate from everything, until they meet the Mahayana. When they meet the Mahayana, which Buddha did teach them, of course, in his own time, and great teachers in the Theravada Church have always taught that, actually. And they even are doing it again now, where they're beginning to reappreciate that in their own past, in Burma and Thailand and and uh, and Cambodia and uh, Sri Lanka and so forth, they had Mahayana. They they moved to the non-dual. They moved the compassion as well as the wisdom level. They're beginning to realize that again. But temporarily they got isolated when the main thing was destroyed in India for a few thousand, a few hundred years, a few cent, many centuries. Compassion is the least, and they have, but because they have compassion, it's not, they're not all just total psychos. The total psycho has become a formless realm deity, and they have a much longer road to coming back to the, to the, the gym, the four friendly fun fact gym. Of developing compassion and wisdom to and bliss together, compassion is the most important aspect of full enlightenment, because without it, one too easily enters a state of being unmoved emotionally. By the way, there are people who achieve awakening without compassion. Or, you know, they do become a kind of saint because they are beyond crude drives that lead them to cause harm to others. But since they see through others too easily, by seeing through themselves in it too strict a way, their motivation to love them and help them free themselves becomes weak because they don't think it's possible. They tend to rely on full Buddhas, those who become awake and nurture compassion at the same time, to do the job rather than feeling the intense motivation to become Buddhas themselves to take responsibility for others. The fourth friendly fun fact or noble truth, the path, seemed sensible to me. I didn't, it seemed sensible to me. I didn't like that the eighth branch was meditation or samadhi, i.e. one-pointed concentration, and that the first branch was realistic world. I didn't really like that. I wanted meditation right away. I wanted to be on all eight lanes right away. I wanted to be at the eighth lane to start with if necessary. I was impatient to get out of the world I was tired of ideas, and I wanted to get away. I had had enough. Being so impatient meant that starting with the realistic worldview was very difficult for me. I did it, though. I soon relished, and I soon came to relish the first branch, realistic worldview, seeing it as indispensable to the other seven branches, realistic motivation, speech, evolutionary action, livelihood, effort, mindfulness, and samadhi, concentration, meditation. I loved all eight of them and wanted to fold them all up in the eighth samadhi meditation. I was frustrated at that, that point by my teacher, my beloved teacher. He, I was mad at him as he predicted I would be. He skipped passages in Nagarjuna's book we were reading. Those on dhyana zen, which is the Sanskrit form that underlies the Japanese word zen, and samadhi, those meditative kinds of things. He skipped the details, said, oh, you don't need this. I did love that book. And there was a funny thing. When I read it in Tibetan, I felt it viscerally. But in English, after we translated it, I didn't connect to it in quite the same way. Maybe, again, that was some memory impression from a former life. In my first popular book, In a Revolution, I talked about life, liberty, and the pursuit of real happiness, that's the subtitle. Since I was 
fitting nirvana in with Thomas Jefferson's Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Happiness. People focus on the first noble truth or fun fact, the truth of suffering, even Buddhist teachers, since it fits with the miserableness of people. It's amazing how people feel anxious but safe being miserable. After all, what we call happiness is usually illegal. When you feel really happy, you feel frightened or at least nervous. We are indoctrinated to think this is a dangerous letting down of our boundaries. It's too intense, like an orgasm. It's too high, and it will lead to a downfall that will come afterward. People look at you dubiously if you're too happy. Just imagine this. You're a patient. You're a parent, rather. Just imagine this. You're a parent, and your kid comes home and says to you, I'm so happy. The world is so beautiful. Everything is wonderful. Are you happy? Well, not right away. If you immediately ask that child, what happened to you? Are you on drugs? Are you drunk? <laughs> you freak out. You have difficulty, or are you being bipolar? You know, are, you, are you being manic? You freak out. You have difficulty accepting that they can be happy for no reason, that they can have this inner feeling welling up from their heart that they feel happy, truly, and you can't believe that there are no dangerous side effects. If you do manage to accept it in someone else, that they're just really happy, just from within, you then feel left out. Subconsciously or consciously, you are jealous. You think, well, what about me? Why aren't, why aren't I happy too? The truth, the announcement by Buddha under a tree, is that the actual reality of the world is itself freedom from suffering. He is saying that it is already bliss. He doesn't make too much of a fuss about it at first, this cessation of suffering. He tends to cater to the immature first level of hope that is kindled in the egocentric person who th who is sunk in the well of habitual suffering. I don't mean that moralistically. I'm talking psychologically. I'm making a structural statement about someone who thinks that his or her center is real and even is absolute unquestionable reality. Such a person cannot imagine one's being in total bliss while still being connected to everything else. Such a person sees relief from suffering as a kind of dissociation from everything else, just as I did. Fortunately, thanks to the Mahayana, the universal vehicle, to my teacher, Gijiwan Yala, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, and later Nena, my wife, or home guru, I eventually overcame this idea that the state of nirvana is outside the world. For some people, though, some of the time, it's not a bad thing that they think that. And certainly, even though the Bodhisattva is still in the world for the sake of others, being utterly free of her or his own suffering. It's just like being in another place, a different world entirely. That's why non-dualistic Buddhist teaching can support a dualistic approach. It can, it can. <clears throat> Theravada Buddhism and absolute happiness, although I've already really been talking about it, but a little more nominally I'll read ahead. Theravada Buddhism, the most basic branch of Buddhism that has been around for thousands of years, which I call individual vehicle. I never call it the standard lesser vehicle, a standard in Tibet or even in India or China, the lesser vehicle. It is still relevant and highly valuable today because it leads you to seek a state that is different from what you know. It doesn't matter how you imagine it when you seek it at first. You can inaccurately imagine nirvana as a separation from the world. It still motivates you to find absolute happiness, which you, there is such a thing. Absolute happiness and absolute suffering may seem like different things, but they are connected. Inasmuch as the motivation to be free from absolute suffering is what leads you to find absolute happiness. <laughs> then you have... Your absolute happiness is relative suffering in others. This is why dualistic Buddhism, that becomes, in other words, 
your wisdom of that becomes your compassion and love. You know, they have a wonderful expression, my, one of my favorites in all of the Sanskrit literature, is Nagarjuna's expression, which is also in the group Transcendent Wisdom Sutras, which is emptiness, shunyata karuna garbham, emptiness, the womb of compassion, freedom, the womb of compassion. This is where freedom, instead of become some sort of space-time, you know, infinity, eternity trap, it becomes a sensitive membrane, nurturing membrane that enfolds absolutely everything. That's what it becomes. Medicine for all suffering. Really wonderful. Shunyata karuna karbam. Another translation for emptiness could be zero-ness. And remember, zero-ness is the digital system. When you have zero-ness, it means that there's always a place to put any one thing. That it's not a separation. That everything ultimately is enumerated, you know. Wonderful. This is why dualistic Buddhism is the base or, for, or foundation of non-dualistic Buddhism. The ordinary person cannot imagine a state of complete freedom in bliss while remaining aware of interrelationships and being connected to everyone who is not in bliss. Such a non-dual reality is rarely possible for a beginner. For example, when I heard the thing other than as a world view, so a rational way of being, that everything is interconnected, that there's no absolute outside of the relative, because if it was outside, it's relative. <laughs> the only possible absolute is the nature of the relative, in other words. It is the whole of the relative. That's the only possible absolute. That's, that's the absolute of freedom, of emptiness. And it is empty of itself, too. It's, it's a, such a subtle absolute. It's absolute. It's empty of being absolute. So therefore, in a sense, it's only relative absolute. But apparently it's pretty groovy. The, oh, yeah. Such a non-dual reality is really possible for a beginner. For example, when I heard the third noble truth or friendly fun fact, that this presence of reality I first assumed was outside of the relational web, was actually within and all around me, my hair just stood on end. As a samsara versus nirvana dualist, I still wanted to be free of myself, only happy if elsewhere. The fundamental predicament of self and other is that when self and other are seen as intrinsically really different, the encounters between them are married to so much painful contact with so many sharp edges, and they are highly problematic. According to Buddhism, during countless lifetimes, we have been killed, eaten, robbed, and tortured by other beings, and we have reacted to others by developing internal sicknesses. Understandably, this leads to a deep instinctual fear of encounter with an quote, other, unquote. The second noble truth, the cause of pain, is the delusion about, the second, you know, friendly fun fact, is the delusion about the absoluteness of the separateness of self, i.e. the delusion regarding the intrinsic reality, objectivity, or identity of the self. This becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy when one is under this delusion. Contact with others does tend to become a bit stressful. If we can make our own body into something separate in our minds, then everything else is suffering. So, at the beginning of my practice, I was trying to get away from the whole thing. What I didn't know then, and had never heard of, was that the negative result of that kind of mistaken view is found in the teachings as attaining the cessation of sensation and conception at the wrong time. I had never heard of this at that time and didn't know what it was about. But from my present vantage, I can now understand the great kindness of Geshe-la, my teacher, and his incredible skill, because I think I had a kind of dualistic experience of the nirvana threshold states, which are called the four formless or immaterial trances. Some translators use the word absorptions, which makes me think of bounty paper towels. <laughs> 
ads, unfortunately. So trances, I prefer. I think is a much better single syllable word, a trance. The trance of infinite space, the trance of infinite consciousness, the trance of seeming nothingness, and the trance of beyond consciousness and unconsciousness. Instead of absorptions. Anyway, I was so into the development toward this realistic motivation, full liberation, I felt I just had to become a bhikshu, a Buddhist mendicant monk. I wanted to have no other concern in life in principle than learning, meditating, and realizing the nature of reality, which is the complete liberation from suffering. When you become really real, then you're totally liberated from suffering. When you, you, you become nirvana. You are the third noble truth. Suffering stop, stops before it starts in you. And this makes you a super healer and teacher of others as a Buddha, as blossom, when you blossom into a Buddha and through that. One of the problems was that, again, my teacher Geshala refused to make me a monk. <laughs> he said it was fine to me to live like one, as I was doing, and focus as much as I could afford it on the positive development person, purpose, that as a life purpose. But in the long run, in my lifetime, in this culture, it would not be my lot to remain a monk. You have to stay for life in the Tibetan tradition, or it is a shameful embarrassment. In other words, you don't just be a monk for a year or a day or whatever. You know, that which you can in the Thai tradition, they have modified the monastic rule so you can temporarily do that when as a young person, which is actually not a bad idea. But in Tibet, you can't. It's supposed to be lifetime. In ancient India, it was lifetime. You can't be a monk for a while and then quit. He acknowledged that I, in, my, in his saying I shouldn't do it and refusing to ordain me, he acknowledged that I was sincere and had no such intention of quitting and truly wanted to be a permanent monk. He just knew from his experience, his knowledge of my past lives momentum, perhaps, that I would, and certainly his knowledge of this culture, this, this non-anti-monastic culture, Protestant ethnic culture, his knowledge of, you know, that I would not be able to remain a monk in my particular Bob Thurman lifetime. I had a different destiny. Regardless, I disobeyed him as my teacher, even though that's why he refused to be my teacher, you see. He just was my friend. He would always say, I'm not your guru, you know, like the spiritual teacher for a formal role, because I would disobey, I would be angry with him, and so on. And I so I disobeyed him, and I bugged him about being a monk. I wanted more meditation and a more formal way to be a monk. He admired my resolve, but insisted I be more practical and listen to his advice. I could not do that. I was too stubbornly insistent on my view and plan so I kept learning a lot. We were at this impasse. Later I found out that there are some circumstances wherein one has to stay a lay person and develop the other engaging, self-giving virtues as well as the self-improvement ones. The very key is to create a new form of super-education, to create a big change in our society and radiate it out from America throughout the world not through military regime change and so forth, but through art, the art of happiness, the art of joy, the art of mindfulness, yoga, and meditation. In this magnificent enterprise, India, its civilization and complete culture as restored by the Tibetans, bringing back India's own long-lost Buddhism, is our key ally, along with all the indigenous Earth-centric cultures on the planet. So Buddhism without Buddhism is another heading now. So that's really fun. And, you know, in other words, apparently I had been a monk in many previous lifetimes, which Kishiwango knew, although he didn't tell me. I didn't know either, viscerally, I imagine, maybe, but I didn't know. Because then it was amazing. I spoke, oh, I never mentioned in a book here, but I learned to be fluent in Tibetan in about 10 weeks. I was speaking fluently without an accent. And everybody was freaked out. And then I was annoying some other younger Tibetans, lamas and one another geishe, 
who were younger, and I started debating them all the time. I was supposed to be their English teacher, and my arrangement with my spiritual friend, non-guru spiritual friend, Geshe Mahya, I was supposed to be teaching English, and I did, but then in, the, in off time I would annoy them by debating them and so on, because I was sort of immediately omniscient, like an arrogant 23-year-old. And uh, so, too arrogant. And even Geshwangal, even I didn't tell so these many stories because you can't, but Geshwangal refused to teach me debate strategy the way Tibetans do it, where they do their fierce debating. Because debate, you know, Dharma combat debate is considered really, really important because debating with another person rationally gets you able to critique yourself and debate yourself, and you learn where you make mistakes, and then you 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 don't just sort of assume whatever you think is right. You learn to critique and look into what you think and challenge it and change it. And first you have to debate and lose for a while with other people and sometimes win, sometimes lose. And so it's really, really important in the in the Indian and Tibetan curriculum of the great enlightening monastic universities. But he refused to teach me that. And I said, well, why won't you teach me that? Come on, I want to debate everybody. And he said, you don't need to know that. You have a natural skill at debating. But if you know that, you are you know the strategies that are developed over centuries in the Tibetan monasteries, you will make too many people too unhappy in the future. <laughs> he told me that, and he was I'm sure right. Anyway, anyway, so that's what he did. So so then he was going to take me to meet the Dalai Lama. I think I tell that story later, so I won't tell it right now. So that maybe Dalai Lama will make you a monk, he said, and then he took me to India and after a year or two of this of this impasse. You know. So Buddhism without Buddhism. Now I'm sorry, which I think we are oh yeah. So you know so he realized that maybe A he realized that I was too egocentric and had to really manage it. Let's just be very normal and honest. A, and B, maybe he realized that from my former lives I had chosen to be reborn in this sort of backward country with all its armaments and all its militarism and all its egocentric stuff. I'd be out for number one and greed, greed and living on the genocide of the native people and the enslavement of the blacks and so on, the racism and so on, and the, and the cheap labor of immigrants since then. And... Uh, uh, you know, that that uh, my task was to try to fit the education, uh, the super education of the eight lane highway, the noble eightfold path to to love and wisdom within this more aggressive culture. And to do that, I needed to be a lay person. And I need to be sort of more, you know, understanding the culture, not just isolate from the culture. So, and and then, and, uh, and India, having been totally modernized and materialized, also needed this. And so I've always felt a need to do the same kind of gig in India, which, which is all not just really doing, of course. And I just wanted to go along with that as an American, you know. So anyway, I, I won't talk into the, the history of that so much now. But that's, I think, that's what he already knew. He was way ahead of me in that. So Buddhism without Buddhism is the next heading in this chapter. So Buddhism is not only entering the West via traditional Western Buddhist publications, such as Lion's Roar, Tricycle, and so forth. It is also coming in via Scientific American, etc., and such journals, and neuroscience journals and things. For example, mindfulness has gone mainstream, I gave a series of lectures in California in the 1990s entitled Buddhism Without Buddhism, in which I said that Buddhism would be countercultural at first. First view is an artifact of Buddhist countries, that it naturally started that way, but that it would go mainstream when people saw the importance of mindfulness, self-cultivation, and self-applied mental hygiene, and put it into their lives without becoming, quote, Buddhist, unquote. Then it would become an innovation in our own culture, and people would use it happily, and it would deliver real benefits, 
And, you know, I should say, His Holiness would have said, and they can do that within the cultural context of whatever their birth religion or birth ideology, if they're scientific humanists or secularists. In other words, Buddhism can help with the education and the evolutionary development of the individuals without becoming a challenge, without converting people to some culture that wouldn't fit them from where they were, wouldn't meet where they were at, so to speak. Think, for example, of John Kabat-Zinn's work on, I'm not saying I'm the only one, it's similar, John Kabat-Zinn, the great work on mindfulness-based stress reduction, which is integrated enough to have an acronym, MBSR, and that sort of thing. People are bringing Buddhism into a more mainstream role via education and, they're, and, and even therapy, clinical thing, and they're even getting away from the term meditation, for example, which is perceived as countercultural by some, seeming a bit like a heresy. Instead, they're going with phrases like mental hygiene or concentration or anti-ADHD therapy, etc. And that's how it should be done. You can be a member of another religion and still engage in these practices without weakening your faith, in fact, strengthening it. To make, although it might change some detail of the theology, theological choices, that might happen. Especially, I think, it might weaken the exclusivism, which is the great thing that leads to the danger of interreligious conflict. That I do think. I would be maybe different, maybe I'd be a little more strong on that line than His Holiness wants to be, because he is actually the leader, considered the leader of religion, whereas I'm just a professor, so I can. So, to make Buddhism more, more mainstream in the United States, you can do what His Holiness the Dalai Lama does with utmost sincerity, not just as a strategy, but with great sincerity. Insist that the main thing is to understand there is no need to convert. It's preferable to remain with your family religion or non-religion, but you can still listen to lectures on Buddhism and experiment with Buddhist practices simply as educational experiments for the mind. The procedure of teaching and learning that Buddha, what Buddha, that Buddha put forth in the Eightfold Path is preserved in all forms of Buddhism, whether or not they are explicitly so labeled. This being the case, Keshala's inter interrupting of my unlearned, escapist, meditation trance efforts and his insistence that my life purpose would not be accomplished by my being a monk, as admirable and necessary as that was in general, turned out ultimately to be a real godsend. This is a very important point to make to new Buddhists, old Buddhists, and modern Buddhists who tend to think the doorway to Buddhism is meditation and ascertain and asceticism. Some even say that Buddhism itself is only meditation, only withdrawing from the world, which actually is very wrong. Buddha taught the dualistic form of Buddhism to his less emotionally developed disciple, mostly highly intellectual, world-weary, mostly male Brahmin ascetics from the priest class with a very strong sense of self-absolutization who wouldn't have been able to easily imagine the world of life and death, pain, women, kitchen, cooking, hunger, injustice, etc., as nirvana, no matter what their level of sophistication. And that is what I wanted to do right away, jump into a trance, a seemingly uncompounded transcendental state, and consider it a done deal apart from the world. Where Buddha left the door open for them and me was that he never clearly described nirvana as such an absolutely abstract state. On the contrary, he did clearly describe the quite attainable four absolute seeming bodiless formless trance states of infinite space, infinite, aware, infinite awareness, unconscious nothingness, and beyond consciousness and unconsciousness, and he clearly stated that none of them is nirvana. And uh, although, and then actually, you know, it's just like where, you know, the way he therefore rejected my right self righteous demand, I want to be a monk right away, I want to go into trance and attain nirvana by meditation right away. When I did that in a dualistic way, he was saying to me the same thing 
that was said by the goddess to Shariputra in the Vimalakirti Sutra when she mentioned that Buddha revealed this is a Buddha verse, this is perfect nirvana already, and then there is everything is already bliss, everything there is a self of being aware of that, a Buddha self. There is a it's permanently it always has been like that, and it's pure and perfect and beautiful. And when he said, Well, what about the four noble truths? It's uh, the first noble truth that it's suffering only, you know, being here. But Buddha taught that. How can you say that he sees this? And she said, Well, he taught that to the overly proud, the overly arrogant. He taught them that to make them sort of acknowledge the difficulties and the problems of their worldview. But this is now his real revelation, he said. Is the third no, and he said that in terms of the four noble truths, friendly from text, by saying the third one is the real one. The first, second, and fourth have an illusory quality; they're not totally non-existent, but they are not, you know, like a pure illusion. They're illusory. They're like an illusion. They're less real than the really real one. So they're unreally real, or something like that. So okay, that's there. We are. With the door open, and almost at the end, maybe I'll go over a little. I get to the end of motivation. It's just not long. So the realistic worldview and therefore the realistic motivation for life purpose are the first two branches of the noble and the friendly eightfold path. Realistic worldview is where you have to learn and critically reflect with your thinking power to develop wisdom. So you can get wisdom at the coarse reality or conceptual level through reason, through inference, and once you develop critical wisdom, even on a discursive level, then your intention or life purpose to travel the path to enlightenment as the meaning of all your lives, the present one and all your future ones, becomes the inevitable, logical step from, from your realistic worldview. Why waste your precious human lifetime doing anything less than using every conscious moment to evolve toward Buddhahood? If it is one's life purpose as a human evolutionary being to attain the bliss of enlightenment, nothing less than pure bliss, <laughs> and you feel much better when you adopt this super motive, then you also must develop the altruistic mind of love and compassion for all beings to bring them with you, to share your bliss with them. That spirit, the spirit of universal enlightenment that makes you a bodhisattva, or open, or awake, which is say a open-hearted or awakened-hearted being, is the cause of the firm stability of Buddhahood, the blissful way of remaining in the world for the benefit of others, while always feeling the blissful presence of Nirvana permeating the entire situation. Once realistic worldview and realistic motivation for self and other are in place, the ethical branches of the path automatically follow. One lives with realistic speech, action, and livelihood, those three, and then creative effort, the fourth. And on that calm and loving basis, the mental branches of realistic mindfulness meditation and realistic concentration meditation become possible and fruitful. So now, if we have come to understand our life purpose as using the amazing human life form we have achieved to evolve toward its summit perfection of perfect wisdom and perfect love and compassion, we embark on the ethical transformation that is required as a foundation. And it is interesting that this begins with realistic speech, which is that through which we interconnect with others already, where we hear that, where they listen to us and we listen to them. And one thing I want to say, that my... You know, in ancient India and then in Tibet as it developed, everybody wanted to be monk, a mendicant, you know, nun or monk, mendicant, and have a lifelong scholarship. They already realized Buckminster Fuller's uh, idea that everyone who had the wish to become super educated should be put on a lifelong MacArthur Fellowship. Don't even do need to apply to a foundation or anything. They, everyone and the things that they would produce for the benefit of society would far outweigh the cost of that free food, free lodging, and the various exemptions that you get as a mendicant. 
But on the other hand, in societies like ours, where we're in this world crisis, we are in a Protestant ethic, have to be a productive society, then we can deal with the education in an educational way. This was very worked out well, in, I think, in my life to be a professor in a university. And then there are teachers at all levels. Actually, the ones who teach the grade skills are almost more important, but they don't have the right curriculum yet, but they're really slowly getting it. So it's a matter of shifting priorities. Even if you have to have a job, even if you do want to raise a family and be a parent, and if you're there for the long term and you have to show some degree of routinized, culturally expected ways of being, spending your time, you can still remember at all times that your highest priority is to evolve as a being, but which you do through being compassionate and loving and helpful and friendly to others and learning and learning, and you become a lifelong learner and you become a lifelong practitioner and you develop ways of, and you also meditate when you can, but you do, and you develop ways of meditating in life 24-7. You know, and the way you do things becomes a meditation for you. And that's where then ethics gets involved, which we will move on to in the next session. So thank you very much. It's been wonderful to have this session with you. So by the virtue of this, may I quickly become a Manjushri, an enlightened being, to quickly help others become fully enlightened, just equal to me. That is how I dedicate the merit of this session. Okay, thank you very much.